Welcome. Um, I'm pulling up a presentation. Hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Bruce Buttram. I'm the Chief Grants Management Officer at the Fogarty International Center. Uh, today's presentation will uh, focus on kind of an introduction to NIH, <clears throat> the extramural process uh, um, regarding grants and contracts, and some information about Fogarty International Center specifically. <clears throat> the NIH is the principal health research agency for the U.S. federal government. The NIH is a component of the Department of Health and Human Services. The next two slides will show the components of the DHHS and the 27 institutes and centers. So uh, at here you can see the slide. Um, it's the different components of HHS, DHHS, and you can see NIH is one of the op optives of DHHS. Next on the slide is the slide of the NIH and the 27 institutes and centers. As you can see in green below, Fogarty International Center is one of the institutes and centers at NIH. Um, the bottom three at the bottom uh, are, have no funding of authority to make like grant awards. Um, so uh, one is the clinical center, which is the hospital at NIH campus. Uh, another is the Center for Information Technology, which is our IT people and our IT infrastructure. And uh, the third is the Center for Scientific Review. The Center for Scientific Review uh, is a, uh, a center that reviews about 80% of the 60,000 applications that are received uh, by NIH each year uh, for grants. I just wanted to give you a quick slide about how a typical NIH institute or center is organized. <clears throat> the center uh, has the uh, office of the director. They usually have a national advisory board or council. They might have also a board of scientific counselors advising the director. Then you then a lot of times it's there's extramural and an intramural department. The extramural department contains the scientific programs and they are funded through grants and contracts. The intramural departments which are world-class uh, um, um, labs at NIH and research done at NIH, and you have your laboratory studies and your clinical studies. This slide uh, shows you um, about uh, the breakdown of the NIH budget. The NIH budget now currently is about $48 billion. Um, this slide shows the, the 2022 final budget. What I want to point out here in this slide is that you'll see that research management and support is about 4.81% of the budget, which is the, the infrastructure to pay for NIH staff, the buildings, everything um, uh, uh, to, to run NIH as far as uh, administratively. Then you have intramural research, which is about 10.76%. And then the remaining balance, these R and D, as then you see R and D contracts makes up about 8.21% of the budget, and then the remaining amount, which is almost 80% of the budget, is in grants. So uh, NIH is predominantly a granting organization uh, in the U.S. government. Uh, this is another slide about intramural re and extramural research. Intramural uh, research makes up about 11% of the NIH budget uh, by nearly 6,000 scientists in its own laboratory uh, and laboratories, um, which are at NIH and, and also in other spots. Extramural is about 80% of NIH funding is awarded through um, some about 80,000 competitive grants or, or to more than 300,000 researchers at more than 2,500 universities, medical schools, and research institutes, um, institutions in every state and around the world. Now, how uh, there, there, there are three uh, major ex NIH extramural funding instruments. The NIH awarding institutes use three major instruments. One is contracts. Uh, used uh, by NIH to get very specific projects or deliverables accomplished within any certain time frame. So 
basically you're contracting very specifically, maybe testing a drug that's already been through all the uh, granting process and you want to just make sure that it's got efficacy or you want to build something or that type of thing. Then you have grants, which NIH provides uh, to support a proposed projects. NIH provides assistance uh, to, uh, to accomplish a proposed project. And then the third thing, third one is a cooperative agreement. NIH is a full partner in the project. NIH provides assistance and subst uh, substantial program involvement. That means that one of the NIH staff members helps with a, gr with a cooperative agreement. And I, I kind of think of it in the terms of helping steer the ship and making sure it accomplishes its goals. So the remaining slides in this presentation will primarily focus on grants and cooperative agreements. Grants and cooperative agreements are normally received by NIH in three ways. Unsolicited grant application, uh, where CSR or one of the uh, NIH uh, review branches uh, will receive applications in an unsolicited manner. So if somebody has an idea, they submit it to NIH. Uh, second way is a program announcement, a PA. Institutes or centers invite applications in a scientific general area for research. Funds are generally not set aside in advance for these projects, but they're usually money available um, for that thing. So you can think of this as like a, a, a pie or an, uh, a, an area of research that the institute or center want to encourage science being done. And a request for application, RFA, Institutes and centers are invited uh, invite applications in a well-defined scientific research area. Specific funds are set aside in advance for these projects. So, uh, you know, um, uh, they might want to make diabetes centers something very, very specific, or uh, a cooperative agreement to test a certain drug for uh, brain tumors. These types of things, something very, very defined. Funding opportunities. Um, how it, how it, how are they? Uh, how do you people apply for the uh, grant funds or cooperative agreements? Uh, the notice of funding opportunity, the NOFO, is a formal announcement inviting grant award applications from extramural investigators. For years, NIH has referred to such a notice as a funding opportunity or an FOA. Um, so the NIH has changed its nomenclature. So this is the new word uh, that's being used across the optives and DHHS. Also, there is a notices of special interest. A NOCI is a simplified notice uh, of specific research in interests. And then also we have notices and NOTs, which basically announce policy procedures and changes to earlier FOAs or general information. This is a really, really nice slide uh, uh, for people to understand the grants process at NIH. And I've talked to many people where they had uh, done this presentation and they said, oh, I've been doing this process for 30 years. So, uh, so people come up with an idea, a research grant application, uh, um, a school or an institution submits the application, it comes to NIH. NIH, it is assigned to the Center for Scientific Review or one of the review uh, branches at uh, the different institutes and centers. Uh, the Center for Scientific Review conducts about 80% of the peer reviews at NIH, but about 20% is done by review branches at the institutes and centers. And this is because it's usually very specific uh, um, specific uh, to their needs. Like, for example, they might have career awards or training grants or want to do clinical trials, and they have to have very, very specific review panels to do that. Uh, then it is assigned to an IRG or a study section to get reviewed. The study section then meets. They give it, evaluate the merit of it, and it the ones that uh, in the top half, um, so about 80,000, I mean, 68,000 uh, um, um, applications are received every year. Uh, about half of those uh, uh, get peer reviewed. Uh, the, the 
it's triage, half of them are triaged with raw comments, and the other half get very specific uh, summary statements. The study section reviews it and evaluates the merit, then the uh, summary statements are then provided to the Institute or Center at NIH. It is then taken uh, it's evaluated for program relevance by the NIH staff, and then it's taken to an advisory council or board, uh, and then uh, action is recommended by staff and the board to the institute director. The institute director then takes final action, uh, decides which grants will be funded, the funds are allocated to conduct the research, and then <clears throat> over here to the left, um, what happens is we get uh, progress reports um, on the, on the grants, um, and we then use those as success stories to go to Congress and say, here are the great things we're doing, and giving feedback, and then this process continues on and on. Um, the peer review, uh, there's a two-stage system for NIH grant applications, and I just kind of referred to that. The first level is uh, the initial scientific merit review of the application. They rate the application and make recommendations uh, appropriate level and support uh, and duration of the award. Like I said, about 50% of the applications get a complete summary statement. The second level of review, or the institute or center council uh, or board, uh, they, they have a second level of review and they assess the quality of the first level of review, the SRG review of the grant applications. They rec make recommendations to institute staff on funding uh, they evaluate program priorities for the whole institute or center, and they advise on policy. So they take a very broader look at the importance of the grants, whether uh, the certain ones are, are more exciting than others, and they provide input to the director. So another uh, issue with foreign grants that specific to foreign grants the peer review process of applications from foreign institution is the same for grant applications in the U.S., but uh, there's two additional things that need to be addressed. Whether the program uh, presents special opportunities for furthering research programs using unusual talent, resources, populations, environmental conditions, and other countries that are not readily available in the U.S. or that augment existing U.S. resources, and then also whether the project uh, has specific relevance to the mission and objectives of the institute or center that has the potential for significantly advancing health sciences in the United States. This slide is just basically, we talked about the peer review process. Well, there's a couple like movies of a mock peer review. So it's uh, I think it's very helpful for many people to see what actually happens in a mock peer review. In other words, what happens in the peer review meeting. Uh, these are a couple a links there that is very helpful for people that want to understand that process. Um, this slide I, I I put in because I just wanted to show that that the the amount of awards that are going directly to foreign institutions and the amount uh, with domestic awards with foreign components uh, keeps on increasing. So there is more and more uh, collaborative research being done between NIH and uh, international institutions. Um, where does NIH post funding opportunities? You can narrow your search uh, for foreign and international in a NOFO by doing the following steps that you can sign up for um, also uh, guide notices to be sent to you on certain things. Um, this is where you can search for opportunities. Um, I, this is the uh, NOFO uh, order of, uh, um, of precedence. Uh, what happens when an FOA and the application guide can include all applications? Which one wins instructions conflicts? Applicants must follow the instructions uh, in, in the application guide, except when there are explicit instructions to do otherwise in the NOFO or a notice. The application guide includes basic instructions. Uh, the NOFO instructions win over the application guide. OK. FOA eligibility. So when, when, when a person is looking, when an 
grantee organization or a PI is looking and they want to see if the FOA, if they're eligible, um, they have to review uh, the eligibility criteria to see if foreign institutions may or may not be eligible, foreign components may or may not be allowed, whether foreign components may or may not be required, or foreign uh, applications are required to submit detailed budgets. Contact NIH uh, program stack, staff if you have any questions on the NOFO. Um, this slide is just a basic slide about the grant review process. Uh, it talks to you about a little bit about the basics, prepare your application, usually about eight weeks before uh, submission. You have to start early. Then after the grant is received, um, uh, hopefully it'll go to peer review or receipt and referral about a month after uh, submission. And then uh, two to eight months after that, it'll go to peer review. And this talks a little bit about uh, the pre-award and post-award monitoring. Um, so pre-award is basically uh, just in time. So if you submit the application, you think you're going to and you're going to do real well, NIH will contact you uh, to provide get a, additional documentation prior to award. I wanted to put a couple slides in here about um, intramural research at NIH. Um, about 15 percent of uh, the, the research at, at and intramural is basic science research, 55% translational and 30% clinical and population-based research. NIH intramural scientists and trainees, about 1,000 summer students uh, come every year, um, 600 post-baccalaureate uh, trainees, 100 medical dental students, 500 grad students, about 3,800 postdoc fellows, 300 staff clinicians, 1,000 staff scientists, and, and on and on, and 900 senior investigators. Uh, the pros and cons of the intramural environment, it's stable long-term resources uh, for productive researchers, uh, ability to conduct high-risk research, availability of the clinical center, uh, uh, the ability to collaborate and interact scientifically both within NIH and with outside scientists. Um, the, the negative uh, cons or the ethics uh, regulations can restrict the acceptance of scientific awards, space con uh, constraints, and other governmental constraints. I now want to go into the roles of the NIA, NIH extramural team. So the scientific review officer is uh, the SRA, which is responsible for the peer review. Uh, um, ensures that it's fair, unbiased uh, evaluation of scientific merit and technical merit. The reviews of the applications for completeness and conformance with application requirements provide a summary of, and they provide a summary of the evaluation. And it's also a point of contact for applications during the review process. These areas um, in, in, the, um, in the model uh, keep everything very independent. So the scientific review is separate from program staff, separate from grant staff, so it keeps it very independent. The grants management officer is responsible for the completion of the business management requirements, evaluates the applications for administrative content and compliance, negotiates and issues the notice of award, and also provides post-award and administrative oversight. The program officer is responsible for the programmatic and scientific and technical aspects of the grant, provides scientific guidance to investigators pre and post award, develops initiatives, provides post award oversight, and get to know that person if you're a, a scientist applying for a grant. They can be a, a, a wealth of knowledge. I'm now going to provide some slides regarding the Fogarty International Center specifically. Okay, the mission of Fogarty International Center is to address global health challenges through innovative and collaborative programs for research and training, and to support and advance the NIH mission through global health partnerships. Why do we, why is there scientific uh, interest in global health? Well, also you can go where the diseases are, the hot spots where TB, AIDS, malaria are, are at, also uh, disease interactions, EB, virus, and, and cofactors. Co genetic backgrounds, um, certain areas of the world have different genetic uh, diseases that can be studied. Um, unusual environments uh, such as arsenic poisoning, uh, occupational hazards, 
Uh, sometimes it's easier to do clinical trials and larger populations, diverse populations, and also distinct materials for scientific use, uh, drug discoveries, like drug things in the Amazon, and also inventions. This slide has the FIC strategic plan goals. I just want to go over those real quick. Build research capacity of individuals and institutions and networks and meet future evolving global health challenges. Second, stimulate innovative and developmental evaluation technology to address global health problems. Third, uh, support research and research training implementation science. And fourth, advance research on prevention and control of dual burden of communicable and non-communicable disease and disability and build strength, strengthen partnerships, advance the global health research and research capacity. So extramural programs are building a global health uh, research workforce, um, developing uh, leaders in the fields requires well-trained individuals, protected time uh, for research and strong mentorships. This just shows you a little bit about um, some of our training and career award programs. Um, it talks about a little bit of the people going to grad student med and, and medical students, um, uh, going into the careers, going into their postdocs, and also going into their careers. And here's a couple of our programs. It talks about the research training, um, our scholars program, our ERSDA program, our K01, and our K43 program. Uh, research op training opportunities, we have our D43U2R grants which are institutional research training programs, uh, uh, potential masters, PhD, um, and postdoc trainees must apply through grantee institutions. Some of our programs are our HIV programs, uh, global infectious diseases, um, non-communicable diseases, bioethics, uh, environmental health and occupational health and trauma and injury. Some of our programs have, were started many, many decades ago. Uh, we also have research opportunities with small grants, R21s and R03s in non-communicable diseases, implementation science, brain disorders, HIV stigma, mobile health. And we have limited U R01 or U01 opportunities um, and um, they're in and uh, you can see them below. NIH also uh, uh, we we participate in several um, uh, NIH common fund programs, um, and you can see these below here, uh, MEPI and H3 Africa. Um, these are several programs that Fogarty also participate in uh, on behalf of NIH. How is FI Fogarty International Center organized? Well, we have the Office of the Director, Public Affairs and the Grants Office are under the Office of the Director. Then we have our different divisions, and I'll go through each of the divisions. Um, our division of uh, uh, DISPI and is a think tank. It conducts studies relevant to programmatic policy directions of FIC, uh, complementing the research activities of the NIH institutes. It devises and uh, on the development, analysis, and evaluation of the programs. Uh, DITER, which is, uh, is responsible for the development, issuance, and scientific management of FIC's extramural research and research training programs. So they handle all the grant programs uh, from the programmatic side. Um, uh, DIEPS is conducts research in epidemiology and mathematical modeling of infectious disease. It concentrates on cross national studies of mortality patterns spe with special emphasis on infl influenza associated disease, vector borne, and disease vaccines, preventable diseases. DIR is our division that works on behalf of Fogarty and the whole NIH to identify opportunities for collaborations with foreign science funding agencies, the US State Department, and US technical agencies and international organizations. And then we have our OMS, uh, OAM, uh, provides administrative support, tracks the FIC budget, and offers special inter international services for all NIH staff. Here's some facts about uh, Fogarty. Uh, Fogarty has the smallest budget of any of, of NIH ICs. Uh, we also do not accept any unsolicited applications. So 
we provide announcements and people can apply just to our announcements. Uh, uh, funds more direct research and research training for institutions in the developing world than any other IC. Uh, partners with most of the NIH ICs, as well as many other government agencies to provide funding. And the research training programs actually began back in 1988 with, with the AIDS uh, epidemic, uh, pandemic, and, um, and the cooperative agreements began in 1993. FIC extramural programs, uh, major research and training sites were in greater than 100 foreign sites and greater than 60 institutions in the US. These are just some slides about the scientific workforce uh, with quotes from different people um, uh, that have been very influential in the international community. Also, what we do is we invest in leaders. So uh, a lot of our trainees back from even the 80s and 90s and stuff have become world leaders in, in their fields in international research. The principles of our successful programs are re responsive to national global priorities, research capacity to strengthen public health, flexibility, long-term and um, uh, partnerships, training linked to innovative research, um, commitment and program outcomes, uh, um, uh, let's see, mutually benefit to collaborators. Here is a, um, a code that you can take with your phone. Um, QR code uh, to look at Fogarty programs. And thank you very much for participating in today's seminar. There are some questions if you have, have points of contact if you have questions.